of Yomtev. We all want to know which way the wind is blowing, so to speak. We'd like to know where the trends are headed, what's around the bend, what we can expect, what's the best way to plan for the future. It's nothing new, actually. Listen to this description of the Jewish people in the Second Temple era, trying to figure out which way the wind blows, literally and figuratively, and what it meant for our future. Quote, on the last night, the night after the last night of Sukkot, everyone would look at the column of smoke rising from the altar in the middle of the temple courtyard in Jerusalem. If it drifted towards the north, the poor people would be happy and the Balabatim would be distressed because this meant abundant rains in the months to come so that produce in the storehouses would spoil quickly and merchants would drop their prices to sell quickly. If the smoke, however, drifted toward the south, it would be the opposite result. The poor would be distressed and the merchants would be happy because it indicated that the rains would be few, so goods would keep longer, followed that prices would remain high. If the wind blew smoke toward the east, everyone would be happy, as a medium amount of rain meant stable prices, which was ultimately good for everyone. And if the wind blew the smoke toward the west, that meant drought, shortages, price instability, which was good for nobody. This is all an account in the Talmud in Tractate Yuma, told in the name of Rabbi Yitzhak Bar Avidimi. The Talmud offers this story, with, that's the end of the quote, by the way. Talmud offers this story without too much reflection, other than to mention a completely contradictory story where the same thing happened, just in the opposite direction. People looked at the way the wind uh, was blowing the smoke from the altar and interpreted it the other way around. And the resolution comes at the end. The people of uh, the land of Israel viewed things one way. The people of Babylon saw things from a different perspective. Well, as more contemporary Jewish wisdom goes, you don't need a weatherman to see which way the wind blows. Human nature being what it is, this supposed indicator of the commercial prospects for the year to come probably preoccupied some people throughout the holidays. It's no simple thing to just turn off your anxiety or your anticipation or your worry uh, for what's to come throughout the course of the holiday. And all of a sudden, after the last night, you shift gears in such a major way. Start checking how the markets did, how's my portfolio, what the headlines are saying, what the futures update is. People were probably anxious about it all through Yom Tif, much like we are in our days. And it probably didn't get any better once they saw that pillar of smoke after Yom Tif, and they probably disagreed with each other on which way the wind was blowing, which way the column of smoke was blowing, and what it meant. The story and its counterpart that says that they interpreted the signs in the opposite manner points not so much to the present-day counterpart of fake news, which is a new name for the old thing. <clears throat> what it suggests, even more than that, is that different people interpret different signs in different ways and act accordingly, or in other words, put very simply, you never know. So if you never know, then how do we know? We're coming now to the close of our second high holiday season, living with the pandemic. We've had mask wearing required. We've been sitting with physical distancing in shul and in the social hall for high holiday services, which limits our capacity and our level of comfort, and of course, our closeness and togetherness of being in shul together, right? That, uh, that all-important feeling. Our daily minion has suffered terribly, as has our Shabbat afternoon, Mincha and Shalashudas, which attracted people from up and down Bayview all over the neighborhood for many years. We may be entering into a new moment now where we can track KSTers who are vaccinated and perhaps allow a move uh, in the direction back towards in-person Kiddush and more social functions. We all want to know which way the wind is blowing, and we're not sure, but we are hopeful. The basis for Shmini Yetzirah and Simchas Torah, this holiday uh, that comes at the conclusion of the whole high holiday season after Sukkot, the basis for it all is the instruction that on the eighth day, there be a festival, uh, another holiday, with uh, offer special offerings, one bull, one ram as the offering. Uh, Rashi comments on this verse in Parshas Emor, uh, mentioning a Gemara and Sukkot. It's like a king, famous story of a king, who invites his children to a festival for the whole uh, town, the whole village, the whole capital city. And when it comes time for the festival to be over and everybody to go, he asks his children, just his family, to stay for one more banquet, just the inner circle, as if to say, this is the quote from the Gemara brought by Rashi, Kasha alai predas chem. Your parting is unsettling for me, says the king. Uh, on the face of it, the parable means that the Jews and God have been so close now for this very intense period of the high holidays, even stretching back to Elul. When we started slicha, started preparing ourselves, sounding the shofar, 
And now everyone's leaving. Everyone's leaving the temple, leaving the shul, leaving Jerusalem, leaving that special designated place of holiness, which has been our home, even our temporary home for the past couple of weeks. Everybody's going back to where they came from. That parting is difficult for God, is what uh, mo- the way most people interpret it. We know that the Jews and God are never separated from each other, no matter where we go, no matter what happens. So what does kasha alai preidas chem? What is, it's difficult for me, your separation. What does that mean? It means God is troubled, so to speak, by our parting from each other, our parting from one another. Most years on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and some extent Sukkot and Simchas Torah, we're together. Of course, we're with God in a very profound way, but we're also with each other. We see each other at this time of year, perhaps more than uh, all other times of the year. We're in Shul, sometimes for much or all of the day, and it's good to be together. This year, still, not unfortunately, not everyone was comfortable being in Shul, and we completely understand that. Still, we made the best of what we have. We did the best we can do. Next year, please God, even better. So thinking of, uh, of another year until we have the opportunity again, until we can all be together in a shul, together in the sukkah, at the kiddush, at a barbecue or a Hanukkah dinner together again, it makes us a little bit less than happy. And yet, and yet, the entire holiday of Sukkot, which is now concluding, and the holiday of Shemini Yetzirah, Simchas Torah, that follows immediately after it, is called in the Siddur, that's what we say uh, in our davening, we call this Zman Simcha Seinu, the time of our joy, the season of our joy. What's that all about? Well, at the end of Sukkot on Monday, which is called Hoshana Rabbah, the conclusion and completion of the whole season of repentance and repair and restoration of our relationship with God is taking place, and of course with each other also. That process that we began even before Rosh Hashanah, a month ago already, to make those amends and to build, rebuild those bridges, it's a big task, and we did it. That's one level of joy, to know that our repentance, our efforts, uh, all of our, everything that we uh, tried to accomplish was accepted. Uh, we, we did it. It's another level of joy entirely to begin something anew, to start another entire dimension, a new level, to write another chapter in our connection with God and with our community and with one another. That's the joy, the added and deepest and highest joy of Simchas Torah, uh, Shemini Yitzhara Simchas Torah, We don't know which way the winds are going to blow. We don't know what the new year will bring, but we know that we've put ourselves in the very best position we possibly can to make the very best out of whatever comes our way. We'll meet it with joy. Whatever it is, please God in good health, and please God will greet everything that comes in the new year together as a kahila, as a community, deeply connected with one another and with God, our source of life and goodness. Chag Sameach, a good yamtif, and a good yor.